Hello, my name is Rick Hunter, and I'm currently in the English department at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, after one year as the JWPA at Quest University, Canada. And I'm going to talk about my experience at an institution that doesn't offer tenure by focusing on my positioning at Quest. And that focus is the method I'll use to explore the value of personal narratives and more deeply understanding configurations of WPA roles. I'll conclude with suggesting a possible resource for those either interested in or already doing WPA work. When I had the opportunity to become a first-time WPA at Quest, I read Dew and Horning's Untenured Faculty as Writing Program Administrators, and I went back to it when working on the proposal for our roundtable. In that collection, Sandy McGlawn's chapter most strongly resonated with my experience. She describes feeling wanted in two senses, first wanted even needed by her institution because of her expertise and then wanted in the sense of being an outlaw, a troublemaker, and a prospective bearer of blame. She was working in a space, quote, between these two extremes, end quote, and it's from this position that she develops a metaphor of the betweens to, quote, help JWPAs describe and reflect upon the multiple negotiations we must take up as we construct our professional ethos, end quote. To provide more context regarding my WPA experience at Quest, it's a private, secular, non-profit liberal arts and sciences university in Squamish, British Columbia. The university opened in 2007 and currently has 540 students. Mine was clearly a Frankenstein position that included directing first-year writing, WAC, and the Writing Center, as well as the Academic Accommodations Program. Given the size and state of the university at the time, these jobs simply had to be done by one person. And contrary to what I was told when I arrived on campus, I soon learned that I would be building these programs largely from scratch. So to summarize, I had a lot to do and was being pulled in many directions by those responsibilities. I also had to continually negotiate my identity from the location of the betweens. I was dealing with the preconceptions of both administrators and faculty while I attempted to do what I was told during the campus interview. Quote, we need you to tell us what this position needs to be, end quote. I only wish that had been true. I was hired as a faculty associate, so the position was originally conceived as academic support. But the differences between full faculty and faculty associates were blurry, which caused confusion for everyone. As a faculty associate, I held what was clear to everyone to be second-class status. Yet I was in charge of key programs that included overseeing faculty teaching and student support both inside and outside the classroom. I also taught courses and performed university service. So some faculty wondered why I couldn't perform other faculty duties such as advising students. And what was the most ironical difference, faculty associates could vote on many issues, but we couldn't vote to decide on the next chief academic officer, our direct supervisor. Another challenge was physical isolation on such a small campus. The Learning Commons co-director and I had offices next to the LC in the library building. However, there wasn't any peer tutoring during the day, so the room sat empty, and this isolation created a literal barrier between us and the faculty. That is, the president, CAO, and all the faculty were on the same floor of the academic building, and so they had plentiful opportunities each day to build both personal and professional relationships. There was also a heavy reliance on face-to-face -face communications for spreading information about meetings, policies, budgets, and teaching. Water cooler culture thrived for those in the right location, but it physically, socially, and politically marginalized those who were not. I hope this doesn't come across as a list of complaints. My intention in this admittedly partial telling of my experience is aimed at highlighting key challenges as well as exploring the strengths and limits of using pronoia to frame WPA work. McLawn makes the argument that we must acknowledge the politically charged location of the J and that we must examine how the betweens position us in order to reclaim them and use them strategically to our advantage. And I would suggest any JWPA to do the same. However, I think that these positions are so strongly tied to the local conditions of an institution that it's difficult to map any particular narrative onto another context. For instance, I think my case is radically different than other narratives I've read and heard, perhaps because Quest University was only in its sixth year when I joined the faculty, and many policies, procedures, and positions were still in flux, if they existed at all. To conclude, I think we need a resource akin to the digital archive of literacy narratives. If you will, a digital archive of WPA narratives.
In my mind, this archive would better lend itself to constructing knowledge through accretion than traditional publishing because it would easily allow many voices to be heard.